I've come today to, to deliver a word, and this is gonna, may sound strange if you're not familiar a lot with church and especially with Spirit-filled church. It may sound strange for me to say I'm not only going to preach to the crowd in this room right now, but I'm going to be preaching to the heavens. Yeah. I'm going to be preaching in the atmosphere because there are principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world who are, who are manipulating the minds of men to cause men to do things, but it's really not the men that are doing them. It's the spirit that's driving them to do these things. It's a spirit of division that drives citizens apart from one another. It's a spirit that drives people to, to commit crimes and do things that are wrong. It's not, they think it's just something that they're up to, but it's a spirit that's trying to do this it's a spirit that'll slip in a marriage and try to cause somebody to cheat on their spouse That's right. come on I, see you won't find that you you find this this uh age that we live in we try to give it a name that makes people feel better about it we change the name and we call right things wrong and wrong things right but we got a new name for it so everybody feels okay about it if, if you had to go to get your abortion you had to go in and say i've come to kill my baby you probably wouldn't go do it but if you go in there to terminate a potential harmful pregnancy from, viable, from unviable tissue matter, then you can swallow that pretty easy and go ahead and have a reason for doing what you're doing. Because what happens is we start worrying more about people's feelings than we worry about the facts. And then we end up doing things and then glossing it over as if it really wasn't. But the judgment of God still comes. And the problem is the Bible says it begins at the house of God. <laughs> mm. If you have a Bible and, or can turn or click to one or whatever, I'm going to be in the book of Daniel. And it's a little bit lengthy. But it's the story that I wanted to read to us so we get a, the gist of what I believe that God is going to say to us today. Because I've come by to deliver a message that God's church is not for sale. Do I have anybody here today? God's church is not for sale. Mm. Daniel 3 verse 10, we'll start with it. It says, Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. King Nebuchadnezzar had built a golden image, and he had decreed a thing that all the people, when you hear the sound of music, you're going to fall down and worship this thing. And so when they, when they played the music, some people did not bow. And these are the tattletales. These are the spies. These are the people that are looking to make sure you comply, that are coming back to the king to tell him, you king, you made a decree that when we hear this, we should fall. Verse 11, And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded you. They serve not your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, It is true. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do, you, do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? And then he says again, Now, if you are ready at the time when you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbuck, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, that you fall down and worship the image I've made, then well. But if you worship not, you'll be cast in the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? I'm going to give you another chance to bow down. I'm going to give you another chance to comply with what I am ordering you to do. And he said, who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. <laughs> Either way, 
we're going to be all right. We're not bowing to your idol. If you kill us, we won't bow. And if you don't kill us and God delivers us, we still aren't going to bow to your lies and your false gods and the things that you have tried to prop up to cause us to deny the things we believe in. Hmm. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury and the form of his visage. King James says that. It just means his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. That means it was seven times hotter than it was ever heated before. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. He called the IRS on them. The most dreadful group of government people that you've ever seen in your life. And it's not even government, really. But, they, but he called them together. In other words, the most mighty men come and bind you. I'm, every bit of this is about intimidation. Every bit of this is a change your mind about the way you're thinking. Give up some of what you're believing in and bow down to what I'm commanding you to do. Mm. And he says, therefore, he commanded the most mighty men, and they were to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast him in the furnace. These men were bound in their coats, their hose and their hats, and other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace was exceeding hot, catch this next part, the flames of the fire slew the men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The, the most mighty men in his army died because the furnace was so hot when they were throwing in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He lost his most mighty men trying to prove his point. Because it doesn't matter after it reaches a certain level. If the whole country goes to hell in a handbasket, it won't matter because I'm going to prove my point. The Bible says, verse 23, These three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire. And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loosed, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is likened to the Son of God. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, somebody. <laughs> somebody been in a furnace before, huh? <laughs> Somebody walked through some fire before and you felt it what it was like when all of a sudden you looked around and there was the image of Almighty God standing beside you saying, don't worry, we're going to come through this together. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to walk through this together. God didn't put out the fire. He just stood with you in the fire. Hallelujah. If I got anybody in here today that's been through the fire, you're going to understand what I'm about to preach to this church. I've come with a message for some and a declaration for others on this first Sunday of September 2023. My assignment today is to make a loud decree and draw a line in the proverbial sand. I'm aware of the personal cost of this type of declaration and the peril it presents to those who stand with me, refusing to be silenced by the political plundering of a government gone bad or the higher voices in a Christian bubble that care more about their own prosperity than they do the preservation of the gospel. I've not come to weigh into the election year posturing, nor am I here to tickle the ear of potential members or seasoned saints. I've been tapped by Jehovah God of heaven to deliver a clear and precise message to every demon in the dark dungeons of the cesspools of hell. As well as every politician, every doctor, every school teacher, every business tycoon, every deep state unelected bureaucrat, every internet influencer, to the entertainment industry, to the culture warrior, to every preacher, every pastor, every singer and songwriter, the worshipers, every saint of the Most High God. Hear ye the word of the Lord this day. Today it is decreed in the heavens that God's church is not for sale. The true church of Almighty God is not for compromise. We will not bend, we will not bow, and we will not burn. In the name of Jesus, His church is the church triumphant. We are here because God has brought us here. No government, no politician, 
No man is going to stop what God is raising up in the earth today. Woo. Hallelujah. I don't really care what it looks like from the outside. I'm not swayed by the argument of intellectuals or afraid of the onslaught of the woke culture warriors. I'm not deterred by an overwhelming attack on my family's health, our finances, or our reputation because I have come on business for the king. My message is an uncompromising truth that God's church is not for sale. Woo. I don't need anybody, but I, I do need somebody. I don't need everybody, but I need somebody. <laughs> I need a couple of somebodies who will stand with me in this declaration. I need one or two blood-bought, hell-fought, mercy-sought children of the Most High God to stand on your feet and shout to the top of your voice, God's church is not for sale. Hallelujah. God's church is not for sale. Hallelujah. You may be seated today. Hmm. It was early Sunday morning in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The day was December the 7th and the year was 1941. 353 Japanese airplanes began swarming all around the harbor. Within a couple of hours, America lost eight battleships, six major airfields, almost all of its airplanes, and 2,400 men. What began at 7.50 a.m. was supposedly a surprise attack, but a closer look reveals an amazing truth. A lazy sellout attitude with generational overtones was the culprit that cost 2,400 men their lives, an historical blemish on America with billions of dollars in damage. These are the startling facts of that infamous morning. That morning, 50 minutes earlier, at 7 o'clock in the morning, while the Japanese warplanes were 137 miles or 50 minutes away, two U.S. soldiers in a small radar station in the Pacific scanned the screen and saw dots appearing until the whole screen was filled with dots. These soldiers notified their youthful supervisor, a lieutenant, no other officer was around, that being a Sunday. The lieutenant thought these must be airplanes showing up from California. Without another thought, he said to these crucial words, don't worry about it. In our own lives, there are situations every day that we look and listen to and then we just look away. We shake our head at our TV when the news media tells us of children that are being mutilated and, and their, their genitalia cut off because some school teacher heard them say, I want to be a boy or I want to be a girl, but we can't tell their parents that this is happening. We shake our head. 50 years ago, people would have stormed the Capitol building. We've seen so much that has come in incremental ways. So slow it's come that it's changing us and we don't even realize the change is taking place. After all, it won't change anything if I speak out. It'll just get me fired. At a minimum, people will think less of me. It's a sad day when we make a bigger fuss about the drive through getting our order wrong than we do about the government infringing on our freedoms. We will pull our car over and get out and go inside and show ourselves over some cold french fries or a missing apple pie, but we will say nothing while our school districts pass laws that empower teachers to keep secrets from our parents about their children's decision to change their gender. I know it's going to be rough, but it ain't going to last long. We will be some hot dogs in a minute. But the truth shall prevail. We will send money to wildlife conservation groups to protect the whales or the spotted owl, but we vote for politicians that brag about aborting babies up till the ninth month. Save the whales, kill the children. There's an, where is the outcry over the fact that the, our FBI this year sent out a memo to place informants in the Catholic Church to spy on parishioners to see if they were extremists because they're conservative. They did it. They got caught doing it. They lied about it under oath. And then they rescinded it. 
Where are the preachers who put down their prosperity points long enough to tell somebody that we got to stand up and tell the world that the church is not for sale? Where are the ministries with mega microphones that will stand up and say, not on my watch? The memo stated, the interest of racially and eth ethnically motivated violent extremists in racial traditionalist and radical traditionalist Catholic ideology almost certainly presents a new mitigation opportunity. The memo issued by the Bureau's Richmond office relied on information compiled by the Southern Poverty Law Center about alleged extremists in Catholic communities that prefer the Latin Mass over conservative social teachings. And we say, we're not Catholic. You're next. They want to come into a church where some goofball like me who they can smash, you know, without even looking back, will get up and tell the truth to a group of people. Somebody, we have to wake up. They want us to take sides. Well, if this senator said it, it must be true because I like him. Washington, D.C. is a cesspool. It doesn't matter if there's an R or a D by their name. They're a cesspool. And until we rise up and take back the mountain of government that God gave us and we start influencing the things that are said and done, if the entire Christian voting bloc voted the same way, we would have everything we ask for every time. We are the only majority left. And yet we are at each other's throat. And we, it's because we drink the Kool-Aid of racial divide I love this church because I always like to say our complexion is good here hallelujah we love one another and there is room for everybody to come and be a part of what God is doing here but I've come today to, to sound an alarm to wake up some people to challenge others and to encourage yet others Our country was almost cut in half with anger on one side and rejoicing on the other when the Supreme Court decision came down on Roe versus Wade. Although their decision did not end abortion, they just allowed voters in each state to determine what the law should be for their state, which is exactly how the framers intended these types of decisions to be made. Making the law federal silences the voice of the people whether it's a Republican law or whether it's a Democrat law. When you make it federal, the people have no choice. The joker in the White House can sign an executive order and you have to just do it. Whoever that is. And we have had some clowns recently. Come <laughs> on, in the last decade. Look at where we're at. fake transgender debate is a manufactured issue that allows the persecution and attack on Christians but if you even misgender them you're a hater and are excoriated even by some so called church leaders churches have changed their doctrines on homosexuality because the, they, the, the uh, uh, kickback is so violent against them they want to get ahead of it by just acting as if it's not even written in the scripture can I tell you something I don't need a Bible to know that's wrong this is the other problem we have by by jumping up and down and screaming if it's not in the Bible I'm not gonna preach it well guess what transgender's not in there but the Holy Ghost tell you a lot about transgender if you learn to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church It was manufactured. It, it was created to push us as church people back to say, okay, whatever. You're going to have to really get into this and study it in order to defend it. And most of us, can I just say, we're lazy when it comes to that. I'll just make my point known and move on. Or I won't say anything. 
I'll just wag my head, turn my face, and just not pay any attention to it. But they're not turning their face. They're not wagging their head. They're coming after your children. They're coming after them with a song. They'll tell you in their protest, we're coming for your kids. Can I tell you something? No man in the history of the earth has ever metamorphosed into a woman or vice versa. There's never been a metamorphosis of a woman into a man. Never, ever in the history of the entire world. And nobody can defend that point. They don't want to talk about that point. They will readily admit that it's happening in the mind of the individual. And so before this became something for them to use as a wedge to divide you and I from one another, what they did was they, they found out that this was a mental disorder called gender identity disorder. But then they said, no, disorder might make them feel bad, so let's call it gender dysphoria. And in the New England Journal of Medicine, it's listed as gender dysphoria. It's a mental disorder. Right now, gun sales are higher than they've ever been. But what might surprise you is it's not backwoods country white supremacists that are buying guns. It's transgender. It's the LBGTQ plus ABCDEFG community are buying guns. Because they're passing the word around that Christians are against them. And the way they intend to defend themselves for Christians, they'll drive down a Nashville street and pass four public schools to get to a private Christian school and go in and kill some nine-year-olds. But you can't see the manifesto because they're still investigating. All this time later, they won't let you see it because the manifesto is going to reveal they hate Christians. And our commandment is to love them. Pastor, what are you doing? I feel like getting a hot dog now. <laughs> I'll raise my hand on that one. <laughs> Let's end this, bro. <laughs> but I, I, come by to, I come by to tell somebody that the church is not for sale. They can make us look like we're crazy. They can call us stupid. They can try to make racists out of us. I don't know how they did that. They took one fella that ran for governor in California, and he, he was black. He's a black man. And they said he put a black face on white supremacy. Yeah, so you don't have a choice. You, it don't matter what color you really are. They're going to still accuse you if you don't say what they want you to say. And if you don't sing the song they're singing, they're going to turn on you faster than you'll even know what happened. Because they're coming. At, what they're doing don't make sense. When have you ever seen a woman change into a man? Oh, you can have surgeries. You can do stuff, but that did, that's not a metamorphosis. Come on, somebody. I can get a pair of airplane wings sewed onto my back. Come on, that don't, that don't make me a 747. And then you are a hater if you don't come up and call me by my pronouns. Come on, I'm Boeing. I'm Bishop Boeing. You would look at me like the crazy man I am if I did something that stupid. Come on, somebody. I can have a toilet plunger sewed into my arm, but that don't make me a, a toilet. That makes me a husband. <laughs> Come on. Airplane wings surgically implanted onto my back would cause me to be a freak. And you would be right to call me that. And you'd be right to teach your children that's a freak. That's not racist to say that to them kids. That's not. Tell your child the truth. They're going to know it one day and they're going to hate you for lying to them all this time. Somebody stand up and say, baby, the church is not for sale. And this is truth. This is the way it is. I'm sorry that the crowd don't believe it. Walk with me and I'll show you. Woo. Sometimes our analogies can be funny, but it's time to take a stand for righteousness. Bloomberg report says fewer people in America believe in God than ever before. 
More churches are for sale now than ever in the history of our nation. Over 5,000 churches per year closes their door since 2019, while an average of 3,000 churches start up. So there's a 2,000 church deficit. But I'm not discouraged by that because I believe the more Holy Ghost churches rise up, the more of those fake churches will close down. Come on, somebody. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. Listen, if they're not taking a stand for righteousness, they have no choice but to close down because they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Jesus came to spoke to the church in Revelation, and he said, I will shut you down. I'll take your candlestick. You won't have a light if you don't repent. Repent means change your way of thinking. He, he lists a bunch of things that he agrees with you on, but there's some things he has a problem with. Jesus had already gone to heaven to fulfill his point. He's making intercession for us. He's kneeling at the, at, you know, making intercession for us. And he stopped and came back to John, the last of the, of the disciples, put on an island to die. God said, get out your pen, write this in the book. I'm about to release some word to you. Revelation 12 said, Revelation 2 verse 12 said, And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he that hath a sharp sword with two edges. In other words, it cuts going in and it cuts coming out. <laughs> I know your works. I know where you dwell, even where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. First, Jesus says, I know your works and where you dwell. I'm aware of the neighborhood you live in. I'm aware of the degradation that's happening in your nation. I understand what you're standing for, and it feels like nobody's listening to what you're saying. I get it, he says. Right where Satan's throne is. Can you imagine being in the midst of a sin city, having the throne of Satan right down the street from you? You may not have a literal throne that you can point out, but we still dwell in the midst of a sinful people. Just like when we begin to praise God, our praises build a throne. And Christ says that he will inhabit the praises of his people. And he will come and sit on the throne of praise that a church may raise up to him in a moment. And that's why things begin to change. Don't you know that whenever people begin to do evil, sinful, vulgar, wrong things, it builds a throne for the enemy to come and put himself up and call himself in dominion over that region. <clears throat> then there was a second commendation where he said to them, you hold fast to my name. They were not selling out as a whole. They remained true to God, even though they were right there in the midst of an incredible evil. The verb hold fast means to grasp forcibly, or in this figurative use, to remain firm. In Revelation 2, 1, Jesus holds the seven stars. He watches over the churches, and here the believers hold fast to his name. My name, quote, points to their adherence to the deity of Christ. In the midst of a pluralistic, pluralistic society, much of the church refused to bow the knee to the false gods among them. They were willing to die for the faith. They were willing to die for what they believed. And Jesus points an example of Antipas, Jesus' faithful martyr whose name means against all. Antipas was the first recorded martyr of Asia. Some people believe that he was slowly roasted to death in a bronze kettle. His name represents the convictions he lived by. He would not give in and he would not compromise. He had to be against everyone. Even if it meant standing against the entire city, he would not bend his knee to spiritual compromise. So you have this great positive report for Pergamos. You have a wicked city, but a faithful group who were willing to die for what they believed. Although they had those among them who were uncompromised, there were also those who were actively involved in sin and the behavior of it, but they were posing and fronting like they were all about some Jesus. This is where it gets to us. <laughs> Jesus was not fooled, so he began to level his criticism at those who were fronting 
and posing as if they were doing it right. But whenever it came time to make the stand, they were not making it. He says, I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Have those there. He said, you have those there. It means you're tolerating what you know to be people who are playing games in your midst. You turn your head when you see sin at the door. You allow people to do things for whatever reason you don't confront what you know is going to come back at you and try to take down your family, destroy your marriage, reach into your bank account, and cause poverty to replace prosperity. So what is the doctrine of Balaam? It is to compromise what we know is morally upright for what is expedient. I'm going to go ahead and do this because I'm going to be able to make twice as much, even though I know it's going to probably be a little compromise in my life. If I, if I sleep with this guy, I'll get promoted all the way to the top. Don't let it get too quiet because it feels like guilt. Go ahead and just somebody say amen. <laughs> don't, don't let it get too quiet. Somebody be like, yeah, preacher, preach. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Mm. We, we, we compromise what we know is morally upright for what's expedient, for what makes us feel better, for what will bless us right now, for what will give us a gain or an edge on our competition, to silently sell out our values to virtue signal to the culture police so we seem tolerant and inclusive, all the while placing a price tag on the truth of the gospel. We want the world to think we're a cool church. If the world ever thinks you've got a cool church, your church is twice dead and plucked up by the roots. If the world ever starts bragging on your church, change churches. Mm, for the church of Pergamum, it began by eating food sacrificed to idols, and then eventually the slippery slope led into spiritual idolatry. It always does. What about the teaching of the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans were followers of Nicholas who apparently taught that you were free in Christ to do whatever you wanted to do. Nicholas never really taught that, just to go to the history of it. Nicholas taught that, that God was more spiritual and was more concerned with spiritual than carnal. And so in his teachings, his descendants began to teach, well, if God's not really caring about carnal, then we can do anything in our flesh we want to. And that's where that came. And they began to give it different names. I've talked about this a little bit before, but this is where the term nickname came from. You got a nickname. See, whenever God gives you a name, God names you. He said, I called you by your name in your mother's womb. Because your name is a prophecy over your life. And every time mama calls you by your name, she's prophesying over your life. Michael means angel close to God. Anthony means anointed one. Lee means out of nobility. So every time my mama called me and when I was in trouble, she used all three of them. Michael, Anthony, Lee... She was prophesying. Angel close to God. Come on, somebody. Out of nobility, she was prophesying the anointed one. She's calling all these names. They mean something. Your name has a prophetic edge. So when God names you Michael, and then your friends call you Bubba. Skeeter. Peebo. I preached this one time before, and I said, my brother called me Peebo my whole life, and then now Brother Gordon calls me Peebo all the time. I had to get Sister Sylvia to give me his nickname. <laughs> He's the king. <laughs> but hear me, I'm not preaching against family nicknames, okay? What I am saying is the Nicolaitans knew this. And it's no different than what we're doing now. We, we take one thing and we call it something else and it's easier to put up with because it's not really, it doesn't really hold the definition when we change our name to it. You could compromise your behavior and mix in what the world is doing and yet at the same time have the reputation of being a lofty, high stronghold of authority and religious superiority. Many believe that they would change the names of sin to make it seem non-toxic. Homosexuality is now an alternate lifestyle. Killing your child in the womb is now abortion. 
The Associated Press has provided a new vocabulary guidance to the newscasters to use words that separate the condition from the person so as to make them feel more like a victim than a culprit. Even people who commit crimes, they won't call them criminals. They don't talk about people in prison as being criminals. They're, they're inmates. See, we, change, we slowly change everything, and whole generations grow up. That's all they've ever heard it called. They don't realize that there that, that used to be a truth. And sometimes there's a shame that goes with the truth. And that shame kind of protects you from doing it anymore. Yes, sir. It kind of pushes it back. But, but it's twisted to mean something different now. It's because everybody needs to feel good about what they're doing. Even if what they're doing is blatantly wrong, it's really not you. So we don't want you to feel you know, feel like that you're a culprit of something, you're just a victim of that. It's really not how it works. If you walk up and do something, you can't blame your daddy for that. You can't blame your mama. They may have been able to guide you differently, and the fact that they didn't means you made a choice without as much knowledge as you needed, but that doesn't mean you can blame them. If you're 14, maybe. But if you're 45, stop. What a sad indictment on the church that we either agree and play along or sit in silence while secular humanists redefine our culture. All we can say when it starts to happen is, this is the end time Jesus is coming back. The church's excuse, as long as I've been in the church, I'm 62 years old, grew up in the church, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost on August the 3rd, 1971. I was 10 years old. And all I've heard, when things start to go bad, nobody comes up with a solution to fix it. They all say, get ready, let's get ready to go because Jesus is coming. I, I got news for you. I got news, he ain't. Not right now. There's a job he left us here to do, and that's to bring the kingdom to the earth. We have to have the earth has to be, has to be empowered by the kingdom of God, and he's going to step in as the king of his kingdom when the, when the church gets her job done. But we're busy selling out and doing the fire escape mentality where we're all gathering by the river and saying, hurry back, Jesus, we've got to get out of here. And Jesus is saying, no, pick up your sword and get back out there and let me empower you to take down this stronghold. Beat David and take down Goliath and let me show you what I can do with just your testimony and your life. The church of God is not for sale. God's church is not for sale. In India, their strategy was said to be the following. Do not persecute Christians or they will become strong and spread. Instead, to get rid of Christianity, wherever you find Christians grouped together, build cinemas, drinking halls, nightclubs, and gambling dens, and they will destroy themselves. All too often it's the case we worship Jesus on Sunday and then we go home and worship pleasure or money or success the rest of the week. But I'm talking to God's remnant today. God has a remnant of people. And we're standing strong in the midst of all of this that's going on around us. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 6? Do, not know, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral... The idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. We don't hear that preached very much. And what? That's what some of us were. Paul went on to say, such were some of you, but you're washed you're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost of God. You are no longer that person. Don't live in that. Don't be a victim of that. Don't walk around with that on you. It, your past has been washed away and now you have the opportunity and the, and the choice to stand up and do the right thing in the kingdom of God. It doesn't get any clearer than this. Such people will not enter the kingdom of God. 
There were all sorts of drunkards and swindlers and homosexuals who came to the church of fellowship in Paul's day. But they didn't stay that way. They came in that way, but they went out another way. Because they got delivered by the power of the Holy Ghost. Such were some of you. Paul said it in past tense. Pure and simple. They were these things, but by the grace of God, they no longer are these things. There's a change coming. And we need to take a stand and not care what's said about us, how people treat us, but decide to uphold the righteousness of God. There's millions of ways we can betray our Lord and shipwreck our faith and destroy our church and bring disrepute to the gospel. Every day we crucify afresh our Lord by open disobedience and deliberate apostasy. Every day we make pathetic, cheap excuses for such activities. Those of you in this room that are getting tired of this, just hang on for a second because I'm preaching to those that are watching that are going to click on later, that are going to hear that this guy got up and preached something and they're going to want to come hear what it was. I promise you it's going to be them that hear that you're not getting away with this. God has a plan and his church is not for sale. I've come to expose the gimmick of hell. I'm almost done, but I've got to finish. In the name of being tolerant and accepting and being relevant and being real, many churches are abandoning the clear biblical teaching on the issue of homosexuality. We have many Christian leaders who have capitulated to the, tradition, to the radical homosexual agenda and have done all they can to appear to be welcoming and tolerant. They've basically renounced the biblical teaching on this topic and have decided that they are somehow more compassionate and more accepting than most Christian churches. They think by abandoning the clear word of Scripture and adopting secular humanism, they can make their church more appealing and more popular. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that when the secular media comes out praising your church or your leader big time, then you know something's wrong there. The very ones who preach tolerance to you have no tolerance when you stand up against them. In order to please men and establish large congregations, one church after another is replacing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the gospel of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want you to feel like this about yourself. I, don't want, I want you to know there's an oppressor and there's an oppressed. You're the oppressed. You're the victim. Every word out of their mouth, some way it means something bad to you. And so your focus doesn't get on defeating the enemy. Your focus is on defeating somebody else in the kingdom. Of course, everyone's welcome in God's church, and that means come as you are. It also means we love you too much to leave you like you are. If somebody loves you, they'll tell you the truth. Jesus told the disciples, what I said to you hurt your feelings. Nevertheless, I'll tell you the truth. Come on, somebody. If you're waiting on Pastor Mike to remain silent in the presence of compromise and blasphemy against the pillars of truth that we hold dear. Baby, you don't have to wait long because I've come to shout it from the mountaintop that God's church is not for sale. How long will you submit your life to some smooth-talking gospel pimp who prostitutes the gospel for money and is more interested in their hair gel, smoke scenes, and skinny jeans than they are territories in the kingdom of God? How long will we sit up under leaders that are not leaders at all? They lead in like a Pied Piper to hell. The whole church follows them because they like the personality. When will it be the thirst of the church from the pew that says, Feed us, pastor. Give us something to drink, pastor. Come on, pastor. Don't let us just die in the Kool-Aid of the world. Don't tell us how rich and famous we're going to be. Don't tell us how much we need to fast and read our Bible. Give us the power. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit of God that has been endowed upon yourself. The problem is many, many, and I'm, again, you've got to stay with me because this, this is scattered, but you've got to stay right here. Many of the pulpits are powerless and impotent because their own lives are out of order in the kingdom of God. They have walked and pretending to be something that they're not. And because many of the people, listen to me now, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but many of the people have no spiritual discernment whatsoever because their, their relationship is with the church and not with the God of the church. And so when you take a stand against it, you're an easy one to cast out. You, something's wrong with you. 
No, baby, when you take a stand against a dead pulpit, when you take a stand against sin on your platform, when you take a stand against things that are wrong, you're taking a righteous stand for the kingdom of God. And never let anybody make you feel ostracized or wrong. You take a stand and let people know God's church is not for sale. I understand being apostolic that these attacks are driven by devils. Preachers won't preach against devils anymore, but I come to tell you there's a devil loose, and if we don't contain that thing, if we don't stop that thing from happening, taking dominion over it, it'll wrap your family up. It'll wrap your finances up. It'll take your pastor down. It'll destroy your church. Somebody needs to realize that this thing is not because you're a Democrat or because you're a Republican. It's because there's a devil on the loose, and you don't need to be participating with his plans I'm here with a stern warning for those who are inclined to build their own kingdom. Judgment begins at the house of God. And I take my apostolic anointing right now to break every curse, to stop every incantation, to expose every vile and corrupt spirit of evil that pretends to live holy. I bind every attempt of the enemy of God's house and his leadership. I come against it with vehement force. Every demon in this audience and under the sound of my voice, you are hereby expelled Your hold is broken on the children of God. Come out of them. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have a financial problem. You got a devil. You need to break that thing off your generations. You can look back at your family and see it. Break it. Break it. Break it. Call that thing out in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have leadership that's slipping. It's a devil. And we've got to stand up against that thing. There's good and there's evil. It's not hard. In the name of Jesus Christ, we're launching an offensive to take our schools back. Brother Carl, you're going to walk in there and deliver some people. Mm. Jason, you're going to go with him. In the name of Jesus, we're going to take back our culture. We're going to take back our government. We're going to take back the entertainment industry. We're going to take back the high ground of righteousness in our society. I break the lie of diversity, equity, and inclusion off of the minds of God's children. We will not partake of the lie of the oppressed and the oppressor. We are above only and not beneath. This is the church triumphant. We will not bend, bow, or burn. We are standing in the righteousness of God. I will not bow so that the government will give me a grant. I will not bow for finances or funding. I will not bow for if you promise you'll back off. I will not bow because of your police state tactics. I will not close the door of this church because you say there's a virus. I've got a God who can heal any virus and who can take down any sickness, any disease in the name of Jesus Christ. We are the force against what the world is trying to do. Don't get mad at Joe Biden. Don't get mad at a party. Get mad at the devil that's trying to infiltrate our government. I'm not telling you what to do about your party. You ain't going to fix this with your vote. I voted in every election since I've been old enough to, and it's got worse every time. I voted for both parties, and it's got worse every time. Don't fool yourself into thinking it's some kind of voting booth. You're going to fix this on your knees, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to fix this with a prayer life. You're going to fix this by pushing your plate back. You're going to fix this by calling on the throne room of God. Invoke the kingdom of God over your city. You want to vote for something, start with the local elections. That's where it's all happening. Come on, somebody. Throw that greasy mayor out of the office and put somebody in there that loves the Lord Jesus Christ and don't just pretend like it on Sunday. Come on, somebody. Take the school superintendent out by his necktie. Come on, somebody. Or if it's a woman by the collar. Don't do it because you know them, because they're friends. Don't do it because you knew their kids. Don't allow the evil. You've got to stand up and be firm and say God's church is not for sale. I'm not closing my church. I'm not wearing your mask. I'm not taking your shot. I'm not playing your gender games. I'm not pretending with you. I'm not calling you something other than your name. This is too urgent to pretend. You've got to call it what it is. It's not an alternate lifestyle. It's blasphemy before the Lord God Almighty. 
It's an abomination unto God. Well, shrimp's an abomination too. Yeah, but shrimp's not an abomination unto God. You know what it means when it says it's an abomination unto God? God is eternal. That means it's an eternal abomina abomination. It's not just whenever you eat something off the bottom of the ocean. But if it's an abomination unto God, it's eternal. And finally, i got to finish. To the weak, kneed, limp-wristed pulpiteers who pose as pastors who would rather compromise for a dollar or some secret sin, be it known unto you this day, God's church is not for sale. I decree and declare to you this day that you will be ripped out of your pulpits with the same speed that Satan was cast out of heaven. Like lightning you will fall and every one that came to your defense will be judged according to their deeds. Every politician who has sold out the Christian faith for power and prosperity. Every movie mogul that has propagated lies on God's people. This way will be exposed. You will come down as faster than you ever went up. Every enemy of Christianity, both small and great, today you have been marked for destruction. There's a war in the heavens today. And you better be known this day that God is not playing with you. He gave Jezebel, even Jezebel, a space to repent. But when that time was over, he said, I will kill her and her children. The dogs are going to lick her blood. Is anyone on the Lord's side? And somebody... Somebody who had been castrated so that they wouldn't have sex with the queen. Somebody who had, been, who had been cut loose. Shoved her out the window. I'm telling you, you're going, they're going to turn on you. That same group that propped you up is going to turn on you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, God is going to raise his church up. And we, the remnant, will assume our rightful place in the army of the living God. Refusing to sell out, refusing to compromise, refusing to put politics above purpose in God on the earth. We will rise in unison and take back our rightful place in the mountains of God, which mirror the seven churches in Revelation. I'll close with where I started. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and he spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... You servants of the Most High God. He had just asked them, You mean you don't serve my God? You don't like my God? Now they went through the fiery furnace, and he goes to the furnace and he says, Servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. The same government that threw them in pulled them out. The same government that said their God was a hater is now saying he's the most high God. When the church finally stands up for what is right, the same government that tried to shut us down will be promoting it. And, the, and then that, that, that fear of a government promoting you and making you think when they start promoting you, you got trouble, that'll all spin around because they're going to look at you and realize it was your God that saved you. And the princes and the governors and the captains and the king's counselors being gathered together, that's the whole group of government, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair on their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. You can't even walk into a convenience store and back out without smelling like smoke. And they were in a complete fire. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. God will stand with those who stand for him. Let's stand together. God's church is not for sale. It's one thing for people to feel warm and fuzzy when they come to church. You never want somebody to come into a church and feel scolded and then leave. Because sometimes churches have hurt people. But I've come by to tell you today, 
If you saw somebody who was deaf and they were walking on a train track and a train was coming and they didn't know it and you ran and you shoved them off the track, you saved their life. It's not how you win friends and influence people to go shove them off the track and you just walk up and cold cock somebody. That's not really a way to greet them and say, hello, I want to be your friend. But whenever the, the moment is urgent, the communications change. You have to do what's necessary to keep them from dying. And so we're living in a moment where the perfect storm is brewing outside. In the principalities and the powers over Ocala, Florida and Central Florida, there are spirits that have come to take your children. There are spirits that have come to take your finances, to take away all of the hope your creative concepts and your witty inventions. There are spirits that have come to pull up and, and, and to be like the, the crows that eat the seeds that were thrown for you. And so we have to rise up at that moment. It's okay. Sometimes it's okay to sit down and coast along. Sometimes you just need a rest. We talked about it before this message. But I'm telling you that God is calling his remnant together. Try on your uniform. Put your boots back on. Make sure they still fit. Pick up your sword. Make sure it's sharp. Don't be caught with no oil in your lamp. Because when the cry comes forth, God is expecting some people to ride with him. Yes, Lord, we will ride with you. <laughs> come on, somebody. We'll ride with you. Not just when you come back, but through the earth today. Lord, we will stand against every vile and corrupt thing the enemy's trying to push. We're not giving up and walking away. We're not turning our head the next time. When we see it, we're going to call it out. We're going to say what it is. We're going to speak it out in the name of Jesus. We don't have to condemn people, but we can condemn the spirit that's driving them. You can look at somebody and say, come out of them in the name of Jesus. They may not know what you're saying, but that devil is afraid of your voice because you have authority in the kingdom of God. When you speak, when you say in Jesus' name, you're not in Bellevue anymore. You have been translated into the throne room of God. And as an ambassador of Christ, the Bible says you decree a thing and it, every word shall be established. And decree right there means legislate. From the throne room, you legislate in prayer. And you say, I decree in the name of Jesus Christ, cancer will not be in my family, not on my, my body, my children's body, my grandchildren's body. I am going to break that curse for generation you decree it we have called this a cancer free zone several years back I, we quit counting in the 30s of people who have come forward with written notices of cancer some of them hospice had already been called in but we laid our hands on them and we prayed for them and God healed them and hospice had to pack their bags and their, and their killing fluids and go home and they lived and they're still alive one after another after another tumors blood diseases cancer free zone because you decree it what is it that you have maybe not cancer maybe it's fibromyalgia maybe it's a hip problem maybe it's fear Maybe you walk in fear. Maybe you can't go to sleep at night. Maybe you're not getting the rest you need because fear or muscle pains or things in your body. Listen, it doesn't matter what it is. He was wounded for transgressions, bruised for iniquity, chastisement of your peace is on him. By his stripes you're healed. All you have to do is step up and receive it. It's not, you don't need to come have some fancy preacher lay his hand on you. It's not me. It's not in the preacher in the platform. You have been empowered with the same power. It's in your life. You call on the Holy Spirit of God and say, rise up, Holy Spirit. I, I command this sickness to leave my body in the name of Jesus. Sickness has to listen to your words. He told Ezekiel, put a, he told Ezekiel, he said, speak to the bones, prophesy to bones. When God is the one who made the bone and he never made a bone to listen. Bones are not designed to hear. They're not. Bones are designed for stability. It's the skeletal frame that, uh, that is who you are. It gives you the ability to be strong, your bones. But God told the prophet, prophesy to the bone and say this to it. Hear the word of the Lord. Woo. And once you told the problem to listen, then it has to hear you say, now bone to bone, sinew to sinew, flesh to flesh, come back together in the way it's supposed to be. And all of it starts to come back together because you told it to hear the word of the Lord. Cancer 
Hear ye the word of the Lord. Woo. Hallelujah. How many of you? How many of you are ready to get your sword out? <laughs> Take down the enemy. Stop what he's been trying to do. Hallelujah. I call on you today to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be a militant church. Listen, if you listen long enough, they will make you think anybody who stands up in confrontation is a hater. Well, if you want to call me a hater, go ahead. Because in Hebrews, it tells me if you love what God loves and you hate what God hates, there's a special anointing that will reside upon your life. So, yeah, I'm a hater. I hate everything God hates. And I love everything God loves. Call me whatever you want. But I'm going to live according to the purposes of God in this world. Grab somebody's hand if you would. Say, this preacher always does this on first Sunday. Our hot dogs are getting cold. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for the word that's been brought today. Thank you, Lord. I release it now into the hands of God Almighty to take it to the places it needs to go. May it be a seed in the heart of the person that's a hearer. May it be a warning to those who have posed and imposters in your kingdom. God, may it be what's needed to be heard by those who are listening to hear something from your voice. And I pray, God, that you would cause us to rise up as the army that you have created, the remnant that you have made. You have preserved us in the kingdom for such a time as this. You didn't let us die on the battlefield. You didn't let us walk away and dry up like a bone. You brought us into this place and you filled us with your spirit. And Father, I pray that you assign us to the battle today, that you put in us, oh God, the power and the anointing to conquer every evil, to speak to, to the things, oh God, that you call us to speak to, to not ignore the sin, to not be trapped by the, uh, the way that they try to put it on us, God, not to be trapped by the foolishness of this world, but in the name of Jesus that we rise up in holiness and in virtue and in strength and power. And God, I thank you for it. I bless what you're doing in your people. I have preached to the heavens today. Most of what I've said has been to the principalities and powers. I pray that you bless your people now, God. Fill them with joy and happiness and peace. Let the Holy Ghost reside in their homes and their marriages and in their finances. Bless them in everything they set their hands to do. And I call this done in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless the food we're about to partake of and for nourishment in our bodies and bless the fellowship in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. God bless you today. If you're guest with us, you're visiting here, we invite you to come over with us next door right here in this fellowship hall. We have food prepared. You can come and enjoy yourself and it fills up in there. We can go over into the kids' classroom and sit in there. There's tables and chairs and let's just have a good time here for a little bit. God bless you all. <laughs>